In this quick tip, we're going to show you how to use Houdini's built-in nodes to import CSV data and to use this data to visualize flight routes. What we're going to need for that is first a database of airports and flight routes. And luckily, there is such a thing called openflights.org, which is an open source database of airports and airline routes maintained by volunteers and available free of charge. So this is really great. And what you want to do is you want to download the airports.dat, which is a data file containing all the airports there are. And on the other hand, what you want to download is this here, the routes.dat, which contains all the airline routes that they have in their database. Before diving into Houdini and beginning the tutorial, I'd like to point out that also our friend Niklas Rosenstein is maintaining its ever-evolving library of useful Houdini nodes at his GitHub. And in the OTLs there, you will find, on the one hand, Niklas's own implementation of a CSV import node, which gives you increased functionality over Houdini's own CSV import, for example, to import data that has been split into individual files, or data that has been gzipped, or to filter incoming data. Also, Niklas has kindly provided a node for importing the open flights data. However, I want to build this setup using only Houdini's built-in functions in order to show you how to work with geographical data. So inside of Houdini, as always, we're going to drop down a geo node, dive in and delete the file node that's here. First, let's import the data. And that's done with the table import node that comes with Houdini. And what this node wants is a file, the file that we just downloaded. Let's open this. And in our case, it's going to be the roots.dat.txt. So that is my root data here. And let me just quickly open that in Notepad++. And what you're going to see here is this data format. And what those individual columns mean is documented on the openflights.org website. What's of interest for us is this number here and this number here as well. And these are airport IDs. So let's check out which column number they reside at. So this one is the zero, first, second, third column, and four, five. This is the fifth column. So we need to import the third and the fifth column of that file. So let's do that and import, whoops, that's one too many, import column number three and column number five. And let's import those as an integer. They are integer IDs. Um, they should have an attribute length of one. It's just one single element that we're going to import. This one is the source. So the first ID that we're importing is the original airport. And the second that we import is the destination airport. So let's call this DST for destination. Let's middle mouse button over this and we see we imported those 67,000 points roughly and these are our routes. Next, we need to import the actual airport locations. Again with a table import node, this time picking the airports.dat.txt file here. And again, if we open that file in Notepad++, we see this. And what we need in order to visualize on the one hand the location of the airports and on the other hand, the routes connecting those airports is the position of each individual airport and its ID. Position is stored as latitude and longitude values in here and here. So this is latitude, this is longitude, and also the airport ID is the very first column here. That means we need to import the zero column and the zero, one, two, three, four, five, sixth, and seventh column. So the zero column is the ID, and that's an integer, and it's got a length of one, just as the other attributes as well. And this is gonna be our latitude, and this is gonna be our longitude, and it's gonna be rows number six, and seven, like so. Be aware that there is a translator which offers you to automatically translate latitude and longitude coordinates to a spherical Cartesian system. So to translate into Houdini's coordinate system, automatic. However, in this case, this did not yield the correct results. So we're gonna need to do this manually. So let's do that by dropping down a point wrangle, wiring it up to the import here then dropping down some VEX code. As I did this setup with Niklas, there is some Niklas coding style in there. I would not necessarily have created a function for this, but let's stay true to Niklas's style. So here we go. Let's create a function for converting spherical to Cartesian coordinates. So this function should return a vector. Let's call it sphere to cart for spherical to Cartesian. And this function should have these arguments should take in floats of latitude, longitude, and radius. And then we're gonna return the radius times a vector that we're gonna create with the set function. Again, Nicholas style coding here. This is basically the trigonometric function to convert from spherical to Cartesian. And it goes like this. The X value is minus cosine of the latitude times the cosine of the longitude. The Y value is the sine of the latitude and the z value is the cosine 
of the latitude times the sine of the longitude. Like this. Let's see if that runs. Yep. And now let's actually create the main part of the program, the one that actually calls this function and converts the coordinates. So what we want to convert is the p. So let's do a vector p. And that should be the sphere to cart. And again, we're going to call this function with those arguments. On the one hand, the latitude, which we have to first convert to radians. So the latitude and the longitude are stored as degrees in the CSV file, and we have to convert them to radians. Same goes for the longitude. And the radius should be one in our case. Also, let's give those points a normal, and we're just going to use spherical normals for this. So our normal equals our position, just normalized, like so. And we see we have this dotted world map that shows us the locations of the six to 7,000 major airports. So now that we have the location of our airports, let's use those locations to visualize the flight routes with the help of another point wrangle, which we're going to wire up to our incoming route data in here. And we will pipe our airport position data into the second slot here. The first thing that we want to do is we want to search these airports coming in through that here for their IDs because the only thing that we have here is the source and the destination ID of an airport. Let's do that and find out which point IDs coming in through this slot here are the corresponding airports to the incoming ID data from here. So let's find the point number for the corresponding source ID by using the find attribval function and we're going to search for a given value on the first slot's data. This slot here, again, this is slot zero, this is slot one. And we want to search for point data. And the point data is called ID. And we want to search for the source value that's coming in through our source attribute, like so. Let's check if that worked. Okay, no error. Let's copy this expression. And we want to also search for the destination, which is just the DST attribute. Now we first want to check if we actually found any matching data. So let's check if our source is equal or bigger than zero, and our destination is equal or bigger than zero, then let's create a new primitive. And it should be a polyline. And let's create and set a prim group for that newly created primitive. Let's call this one new. And the newly created primitive should be in that group. Now let's create two vectors for the source and the destination point. This should be the source point. So let's set it to the source points p value. And let's just copy this and do the same thing for the destination. Like so. Next, let's add those two points. And of course, this is a really coarse mistake. Next, let's calculate the distance between the start and the destination point. And write the distance value on both the starting and the destination point. Let's call it dist. And do the same thing for the destination point. Okay, let's finally connect those two points by adding them as a vertex to our newly created polyline primitive. Like so. All right, and we got some really interesting connections here, like those going straight through the earth. So let's fix that. But first, let's delete some points, because as you can see here in the center point, in the null point, we have several points, and they are many. That's because the incoming data from the routes has been written onto those points, and for each route, an individual point has been created. We use this data and don't need it anymore. So let's clean this up by dropping down a blast and deleting everything but, and it's a point group, delete everything but the new group. And of course, it's not a point group, but a primitive group. Now for fixing those lines that go straight through the earth, what I want to do is project the trajectory back onto a unit sphere. So that's a sphere with a radius of one. For that to work, I need to resample those lines. So they have some intermediate points, which I can then push out onto a sphere. For that, let's use the resample mode. And let's set the length between those points to something rather small, say 0 0.02. So we get lots of points on those lines now. So let's project those points back onto the unit sphere by dropping down a point wrangle again. And this is going to be quick because what we're just going to do is we'll set each point's position 
to the normalized value of its previous position. We see we now project those points back onto the unit sphere. Also, let's just do the same thing for the normals so that they have normals. And let's display them so they're pointing outwards from the sphere. Perfect. Now what annoys me a bit is that all these lines are on the sphere and they are not above the sphere like an airplane route would be. So let's write a bit of code to lift those. Drop down a point triangle again. And I first want to create some interface elements. That is a floating slider and two ramps. Let's first create the floating slider. Let's call that one scale. And let's call it lift scale. There it is. Let's create two ramps, one for a float called lift. Let's call this one lift amount. And in order to drive the lift amount, that is how far the path is lifted from the surface of the earth or the surface of a sphere, it would be nice to know where on the path the point is lying, like from zero to hundred percent. Is it close to the start or is it close to the end? Where is the point? And there is this one argument that the resample node automatically creates, which is extremely handy and it's called curve U, which goes from zero for the start of the curve to one for the end of the curve. So. Let's use the curve U again, create the interface. In here, let's give this a nice lift curve. So set this to a B spline, this as well, and maybe add another point in the middle, say 0.5. So we have this curve here. And for now, that should be good. I'm just going to calculate a new point position now. So I'm going to create a vector. Let's call this one lift pause for lift position. And it's going to be our current position plus our current point normal times the lift, that's what we are getting out of this ramp here, times the scale. And what we want to take into account is the distance between source and destination airports. So the further these airports are apart, the bigger the lift, so the higher the curve. So let's multiply it by the distance and then write this value back to our current point position like so. And we see nothing. That is because the lift scale is not dialed in. So let's slowly increase this and still nothing happening. Let me check. Yeah, I forgot to tell the resample node to actually write out the curve U value. So in here, I have to check the curve U attribute. And now we can see we can immediately get those lifted flight paths here. So again, let's go back in here and dial these back a bit like so. And what I finally want to do for rendering, I want to write a width attribute onto those strands so we can actually render them, for example, using the hair shader. So let's create another float called width. And it's going to be a ramp again, because I want to drive the width by the curve view attribute again. So let's call this width. And let's have the curve view attribute drive it as well. Again, let's set those to B spline, create a new point in the middle here. And write that out to a float called width. But let's multiply it times something rather small so those lines don't get too big. It's like an overall scale factor. I mean, I could have written this out as a, as a float interface as well, but let's just multiply it by a really tiny constant here. In this case, say 0. 0.0005, like so. Save this and go to the render view. And we see we can now render those lines. So what I need to do now in order to finish up my visualization would be to get some Earth model, some globe model. There are some really nice maps from the NASA publicly available and then add that to my scene and light and render it, of course. But this is just a quick overview how to import data into Houdini using Houdini's built-in functions and to use that to visualize positions on a globe and the flight routes between those positions. So I hope you're having fun with this. Again, as every time, we are massively intrigued into the artwork you guys are creating out there. So if you create any artwork using this technique or anything else that you learn on our channel, please let us know. We are amazed about the sheer creativity of you guys. So we'd really love to see that stuff. So it is cheers and goodbye.